These are five reasons why I am not a charismatic. So I've done uh, a few of these videos, uh, five reasons why I'm not Roman Catholic. I did one, five reasons why I'm not Eastern Orthodox, five reasons why I am Lutheran. Uh, and people seem to, to enjoy these, and I've had a lot of requests to do more of those videos. Specifically, people have been asking me to do five reasons why I'm not Anglican and five reasons why I am not charismatic. So I'm going to do the second of those today. So these are five reasons why I am personally not part of the charismatic movement uh, and why I have issues with the charismatic movement in the church today. Uh, so th this isn't to you know bash another tradition or anything like that. Um, and it it's not a, or a rejection of the miraculous existing at all today. This is not meant to be a statement that says that uh, emotion is bad or that experience is bad or that God does not work miracles or cannot work miracles today. Uh, but specifically, I'm going to be diving into some of the aspects of the contemporary charismatic movement, specifically within uh, the Western world uh, in the United States where I am, and why I see major issues with it that are a large part of why I am not part of that movement. Now, the first of these is just really a major theological issue, and that is the notion of fallible prophecy. In the Old Testament, it was a standard rule for the prophets of, of Old Covenant Israel that if a prophecy that they gave didn't come to pass, then that individual was not, was not a true prophet. So how do you know if someone's a prophet or not a prophet? Well, if what they say actually happens, they're a prophet. If what they say doesn't happen, they're not a prophet. That's the simple test of, of a false prophet or a true prophet. Now, that does not include things like, well, if a prophet says, if you don't repent of X, Y will happen, and then they do repent of X and Y doesn't happen. That's not a false prophecy uh, be because that, that's them foretelling the word of God that there is a consequence and because there's a change in behavior and repentance, that consequence doesn't happen. And I'll often see those things referred to by, by some charismatics to defend this idea of, of prophecy that's not always correct. But in, in the modern charismatic movement, there is an idea that prophecy is, is indeed fallible. Uh, as far as I know, everyone I know that has supposed prophetic gifts uh, and that I've seen that has prophetic gifts, supposedly, they have given prophecies of things that just have not happened. They're, they're false prophecies. I, I see this all the time. I mean, pretty much any major charismatic figure that that exists in the world today, uh, it, it can be pretty quickly found out by a Google search that they have had false prophecies. And, you know, that includes people from the most you know extreme end of the kind of charismania, really radical charismatic ends, to, you know, the, the much uh, more cautious and, and mainstream charismatic leaders. I just don't see a biblical category for a prophet who has prophecies that are sometimes true and sometimes false. It seems to go against the very nature of what a prophet is and does. The whole idea behind a prophet is that you can actually trust that their word is the word of God, which is why they have authority and why what they say matters. Now, if a prophet speaks sometimes the word of God and sometimes their own word because they, can't, they can get confused, what are we supposed to trust in, in terms of what a prophet says and, and how is a prophet then authoritative in any real sense? So that, that's the, the first problem I have, which I think is a major, both theological and practical issue. And the, the second issue is, again, just a practical one in terms of where the charismatic movement is today, is that it does seem that the charismatic movement as a whole does not do a very good job at keeping heresy away. It, it does seem to be the case that when you follow modern charismatic movements, starting in the beginning of the 20th century until today, things like the prosperity gospel tend to follow it pretty strongly and pretty consistently as well. A lot of teachings about all sorts of weird things, whether that is, you know, Jesus dying spiritually and being born again in hell or something like that, uh, that you find in some teachers and some other very bizarre doctrines that characterize things like the word of faith movement, they tend to be pretty prominent in the charismatic movement as a whole. And certainly while I recognize that there are plenty of, of people who lean in that direction, who are not falling into those kinds of errors, it does appear that the movement as a whole tends to go that way. And I've said this before, is that when the charismatic movement appears somewhere, it does seem that the prosperity gospel follows behind it right away. And I do think that's telling. 
Uh, it's telling in terms of the discernment of the overall movement and where the charismatic movement often leads. The, the third major issue with the charismatic movement is the emphasis on internal religious experience and particularly a certain kind of emotional religious experience. Now, when I say that, I don't mean to say that I don't believe in religious experience or I don't believe that you know, emotions are a good thing or that uh, our Christian faith should impact our emotions. Of course, of course it should. Emotions are a vital part of, of who we are as, as created beings that God has made. However, within the charismatic movement more broadly, one's, the reality of one's salvation or the test of one's salvation, the assurance of one's salvation tends to be based upon internal religious experiences or external manifestations of that, whether that's something like speaking in tongues or um, you know, a certain kind of emotionality that happens during a worship service, or whether that's having prophecies or visions or the miraculous and things like that. But that simply, anything internal is not a right grounds for assurance. Because what it does, and I've seen this many times, is someone doubts the state of their faith when they're not emotional enough, or they haven't seen enough miracles, or someone sees the conversion experiences that other individuals have, or these miraculous things that supposedly happen to them, and then they look at themselves and then don't see that and wonder, am I really a Christian? And in order to be a Christian, then you have to have these kinds of experiences. In order to know that you're really growing in your faith, you have to have these kinds of, of feelings. You have to feel this way or act this way uh, during worship. But because of the just nature of the human heart, our emotions are you know all over the place. We aren't you know always stable. In fact, we're very unstable. We we go back and forth between one feeling and another. What we need in terms of our assurance is something that is objective, something that we can actually cling to that is outside of ourselves, not our internal religious experience, but something that is extranos or outside of us. And that's why we look to Christ for assurance and what he has done. And then if we want personal assurance, we can look to the means of grace that God has given us, his word and sacraments, where he gives us that objective promise individually to us. And those things serve to give us something, something concrete to grab onto, to know that we belong to Christ, we are his. It's not dependent on our emotions. It's not dependent on any particular religious experience. Again, religious experiences are not bad, um, but they're not a ground of assurance. They can't be. All sorts of people have all sorts of experiences. And those experiences don't necessi necessitate the objective validity of what one claims about those religious experiences. Uh, this is, you know, cults have all sorts of religious experiences. This is why people become part of those movements. Um, so religious experience itself cannot be the grounds for our faith. The ground has to be the objective reality of what Christ has done for us and Christ bringing that to us through the Holy Spirit, applying the, the benefits of what Christ has done for us in the means of grace in word and sacrament. Now, the, the fourth reason that I'm not a charismatic is that what I see often in this movement is that people spend more time, oftentimes, in trying to discern what God is telling them or through either a prophet or somebody who has a word of God from them or trying to discern what God is speaking through their thoughts or their experiences, then they do actually looking at the objective word of God that he, what he's revealed, what he has objectively revealed in his word. And what this can do is just cause a lot of anxiety. You know, I know people who struggle with questions of, you know, who they should marry or what job they should take that, you know, if they don't have an immediate feeling of God is telling me to do this, then I need to do this. And if they don't know that, then maybe they're outside the will of God. And it can lead to a lot of anxiety and despair for people wondering, am I really marrying the person that I should have? Or should I have married someone else? Or should I wait for the spirit to, to tell me something else? But what if I don't feel it? And if I do feel it, what if it's not really the spirit, but it's just my, my mind? And scripture simply never tells us to engage in those kinds of questions. Scripture never directs us to, when you're making a decision, to think internally in your head, speak to God, wait for the Spirit to reveal something to you. And I've seen people do this for things like what parking space they should take. And this is simply not what Scripture directs us to do. And God has actually told us his will, uh, and he's told us his will through his commandments. Uh, and that's pretty simple. 
which is if you want to know what to do, look at God's moral will. Look at what he says is good and right for our lives. He has created us. Uh, he knows what he has created us to be and to do. And he has revealed that to us in his word. So, you know, we don't need to have these kind of internal wrestlings consistently dealing with these questions of what should I do? Am I in God's will? Am I out of God's will? Because God has, in fact, revealed what his will is. And his will is revealed in uh, his word. And that is his His moral law. We are called to, to obey God's moral law. So if we want to know what to do uh, in our vocation, we can ask simple questions. We don't have to say, I have to have this certain feeling or experience to know that's what God wants me to do. Instead, say, okay, uh, what are my skills? Um, how can I use those skills to serve others? And is this job that I'm being offered a way that I can use my skills to serve my neighbor? And if the answer is yes, then do it. <laughs> that, that's all you need to know. And, you know, we certainly we should be praying about decisions and things like that, but we don't need to have this constant or consistent worry or fear about what we're doing, that we're going to be outside of God's will if we do this or that. And that's something that I often see uh, from people that I know within the charismatic movement. And the, the fifth reason uh, that I'm out of charismatic is just flat out that a lot of it's fraudulent. A lot of it's just not real. And, you know, I, I had an experience myself being at a, a charismatic event unintentionally, uh, but there was a, a woman there who said she was a prophet and began prophesying over people. And she prophesied over me at one point. I felt very uncomfortable. And she said all sorts of things about me and who I was. And God was telling her all these things about my personality and all sorts of things. Everything, every word that was said was completely false. I mean, it was just wrong. And none of it was, was true or real. And, you know, that was followed by, you know, people being slain in the spirit and all of this stuff. And, you know, you, this makes you wonder when you see all of this is, well, what is the cause of all of this? You know, is this really people having these experiences? Because it seems to be that this is a false prophet. And if this is a false prophet, do they really have the, the power or authority to slay people in spirit and all of these other things? And, you know, the other words that that person said were, were false as well. Um, and I guess you could go back to that idea that there's well fallible prophecy. She could be a prophet and also be wrong. But th there is so much just fraudulent work in, in the charismatic movement. There, there are so many individuals who use just traditional parlor tricks to heal and do this or that. The same kind of things that, you know, Pharaoh's uh, magicians used, right, with, with Moses and battling with Yahweh in the story of the Exodus. And you can find, you know, Indian gurus who have these same kind of leg lengthening tricks and uh, who show that they can float by holding one of those staves that has like a little seat on it that they're sitting on, but it looks like they're just like floating in the air. Um, not that that's one I've seen from charismatic uh, preachers. Not yet anyway, I don't know. But, you know, there, there are these fraudulent tricks and it does seem that the charismatic movement as a whole tends to be easily duped by these things. And I've seen a lot more things that are fraudulent than I have that are real from major charismatic movements. So um, yeah, again, these are, are just five reasons why personally I'm not a charismatic. These are five issues that, that I have with the movement as a whole as I've experienced it. None of this is to say that I don't believe that the miraculous ever happens. Uh, I'm not a complete cessationist in, in that way, um, but there is nothing in scripture that directs us to search for God's will through our internal wrestlings and God's voice speaking to us. What there is is a lot of admonition to look at scripture as where we find the will of God. And this is not to say that I don't think God ever you know, gives us urgings or, or works in our hearts to give us desires to, to do things. I certainly felt a, what I think is a, well, what is a divine call to the office of the ministry when I, when I pursued pastoral ministry. And, and there was what we call an inter internal call. It was very clear that there was this burden on my heart to go into ministry. There was no doubt about that. And, and I absolutely believe that was the, the work of the spirit there. But God never tells us that that's where we should look for guidance. He tells us that his word is where we should look for guidance. And we look to his word, we pray, and sh can God reveal things otherwise to us? Yeah, if he wants to, 
He seems certainly to have revealed some pretty miraculous things to St. Patrick, if you read that story, um, that had great fruits resulting in, in the gospel being preached throughout Ireland. And we have examples in church history like this. But I think where the charismatic movement goes wrong is in tying God's promises to those things. Or in other words, not just clinging to the word of God and praying to God in relationship with him, and then recognizing that at times those things happen, but instead comes to God with the expectation that the miraculous will happen, that God will speak in these various ways. When scripture simply does not give us that kind of assurance that those things are going to happen. And what it does is leads people into a place of despair, of doubt, of wondering whether they're really saved because they haven't had uh, the right kinds of experiences. So uh, anyway, those are the five reasons why I am not charismatic. If you have any comments or questions on this or push back if you're charismatic and say, I think you're totally wrong, you know, feel free to leave that in the comments and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much. God bless.